Thank you very much, Dom. Appreciate it. And I too am yeah. honored uh, to be here to join uh, this uh, beautiful uh, panel. I've always been uh, since early childhood, uh, very uh, philosophical and practical. That seems to have been uh, uh, two uh, guideposts that have uh, led my journey. And so today uh, I wanted to take a few moments of my time to go through a, a short PowerPoint of the practical nature of yoga science. So I'm going to uh, try to uh, share my screen. And hopefully everybody can see that. And so interestingly, yoga is a science of experiencing unity, of experiencing this oneness. So it starts really uh, uh, with the uh, law of karma and understanding the importance of our thoughts, uh, which is our most, our greatest resource, our thoughts. So as it turns out, and we all know this, this is all fifth grade science. Every thought leads to an action and every action brings about a consequence. And that can lead us in one direction or another all the time in every relationship. And gosh, our whole life is relationship. We have a relationship with our thoughts, our desires, our emotions, with human beings, with animals, with plants, with minerals, with the universe. So it's important to understand what pulse drives you. In other words, what are you looking for in life? What is the consequence that you want every action to lead you closer and closer to? What is your goal of life? So that answer can be manifold, but most of us wanna be happy. We wanna be healthy, we wanna be secure, and we want to experience some form of unity, some form of oneness. And that's perfectly uh, legitimate. Why not? So the, the only question on a practical level is uh, answered uh, through with the language of algebra, X, it's unknown. What's gonna get us to point B from point A? Well, we already know what the answer is from the law of karma. It's our thoughts, our words, and our actions. That's what leads us to our goal or will delay the prospect. And that brings out us to a working definition of yoga. Yoga is both a, a scientific and a philosophical bridge that can helps us, inspires us, instructs us to base our thoughts, our words, and our actions with our own inner intuitive wisdom. And the promise is that if we do that, if we base our thoughts, our words, and our actions on our own inner intuitive wisdom, the consequence is going to enable us to fulfill the purpose of our lives without pain, without misery, and without bondage. So how do we, how do we reach that inner wisdom? How do we contact that uh, inner wisdom? Well, it's interesting. If, if we have a, a, a problem, uh, most of the times we engage the senses and we look outside for some answer. So if I'm cold, I might look for a coat or I might turn up the heat. Mm -hmm. But there are problems where the answer lies within the problem. That would be like a jigsaw puzzle. Oh yes, the jigsaw puzzle is the problem, but the jigsaw puzzle is also the solution. Mm. So from a yogic perspective, we want to be happy, we want to be healthy, we want to be secure, we want to experience unity with the supreme intelligence. How are we going to get to point B from point A? We are going to do that by using this instrument, using this mind-body-sense complex. And interestingly, part of this mind-body-sense complex within this matrix of our reality of me, we have equipment that can receive inner wisdom from the center of consciousness. We call it the conscience. 
Okay. So the conscience operates as a mirror. It has the capacity to reflect perfect wisdom from the super conscious portion of the mind. And it can reflect it into our conscious mind. Now, this is very important to be able to see that because if we don't have this bridge, if we don't rely on our own inner wisdom, we create and maintain conflict between inner wisdom and outer action. Oh, and inner conflict? That's the mother of all problems. If there's going to be conflict in my mind, there has to be conflict outside of my mind, in interpersonal relationships, within my own body. Uh -huh. But if I can ameliorate the inner conflict, I also make it impossible for there to be outer conflict. So from a yogic perspective, from a yogic perspective, the key is to coordinate all the functions of the mind because the mind moves first, then the body follows and the consequences follow from those actions. So we know what kind of consequence we're looking for. We want to be happy, healthy, secure, and we want to experience oneness and unity. So what we need to do is we need to coordinate these functions of the mind. And to do that, we have to take actions. So here's a wheel and it's an, it's an analogy for the body. And we want that wheel to turn, but the wheel cannot turn. Why not? Has no spokes, has no spokes. But if we put spokes in the wheel, theoretically, it should be able to rotate. Okay, so it can do that. That's great. So what are the spokes that animate the body that takes the action that brings about the consequence? Well, that is the four functions of the mind. The first of which are the senses and logic, which is constantly, this function of the mind is constantly asking us the question, should I do it or should I not do it? Should I do it or should I not do it? And it engages the senses into the world to look and smell and taste and hear and touch and bring back information into our awareness, into our consciousness so that we can decide whether we should do it or should we not do it. That's the first function of the mind. The second function of the mind is the ego. The ego always walks around with uh, something like a chainsaw strapped on its hip. And it's always dividing things up into two pairs of opposites. Oh, this is good. Let's uh, reprise this pleasure. And this is bad. Let's avoid that. But we already know from our own personal experience that that which is pleasant is pleasant isn't always good for us. That which is unpleasant isn't always bad for us. So what we're seeing that both with the senses and logic and ego, and also with the unconscious mind, the third function, these are limited perspectives, limited perspectives. They're not always wrong. I mean, we all need uh, uh, a strong ego to be able to uh, operate technology, to uh, drive an automobile. We need a healthy ego for our whole lifetimes. We don't wanna get rid of the ego. Life is to be enjoyed. Why would we wanna deny the senses? And sometimes the unconscious mind has uh, some uh, uh, important information for us. So the senses and logic receive information, the ego, uh, uh, brings information in, the unconscious mind weighs in. And in preparation for an action, uh, the logic and senses then presents limited perspective of the senses of the ego and of the unconscious mind and says, look here, we have two choices. Right now, we have alternative A with these consequences and we have alternative B with these consequences. Kindly make a decision and take an action. And this repeats and repeats and repeats because the logic senses are constantly asking us, should I do it or should I not do it? And if I don't answer the uh, question and I don't make a decision, well, the question keeps on coming, keeps on coming. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I do it or should I not do it? 
oh, it drains my battery. I, I get exhausted, don't I? And so, gee, uh, uh, I have a friend. Uh, I'll ask my friend. This person is a very sweet, loving, considerate, kind person, very knowledgeable. Maybe my friend can help me make a decision. But the truth is that my friend uh, has the same kind of issue going on uh, in their mind. So let's take a look at this schematic. We have the senses and that limited information. We have the ego and that limited information and the unconscious and that information in order to make a decision. But fortunately, we have one more spoke. And that is the key. That's the key. That's our conscience. Our conscience is the only function of the mind that can discriminate, determine, judge, and decide. The only function of the mind. And it's up to us to parent the senses, the ego, the unconscious mind to support this all-knowing wisdom that is reflected by the conscience. Because what does it reflect? It reflects the super conscious wisdom of the unicity. It reflects the wisdom of the super conscious portion of the mind that is part of the definition of the supreme intelligence that we refer to as G-O-D. So through our meditation practice, this focusing of all of our mental energy, we gain skills so that we can coordinate the functions of the mind so that the ego senses an unconscious mind increasingly reflect our, and our partners with the wisdom that is reflected by our conscience. So we gain the skill and the tool of one-pointed attention. We gain the, the, school, the skill of detachment. We create spaces between stimulus and response, unlike what the culture is uh, serving for us. We gain discrimination because we're continuously using our conscience, clearing that, that mirror, and we increase the muscles of our willpower to do what's to be done, but not to do what's not to be done. And we have enhanced confidence, don't we? And we have the ability to solve problems like we never thought we could. And not only is our mental capacity more flexible, but that means that our physicality is more flexible and our immune system is stronger as we continuously engage in transforming stress into strength. So that's something that's practical, it's philosophical, it's scientific, and I wanted to share it with you today. Thank you very much. Wow. That was fantastic. Thank you, Leonard. That was 